This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Representative David Price, Democrat of North Carolina, discusses the rules and roles of Congress, how they have changed over time, and how the legislative body can function better. I think crises tend to centralize power, wouldn't you say? I mean, uh, if you're, um, it's, it's one thing to pass your appropriations bills uh, one at a time in the, in the normal fashion, but uh, often we can't do that. Often uh, you're, you're jammed up at the end of the session. He's interviewed by Representative Gerald Connolly, Democrat of Virginia. More after this. This is Jerry Conley, Congressman from the 11th District of Virginia, and it gives me great pleasure to interview my good friend, the distinguished Congressman from the 4th Congressional District of North Carolina, David Price, on his new book, a revised edition uh, of The Congressional Experience, which is sort of a wonderful combination, David, of a political scientist who's also a practitioner of 30 years. And I think that gives a unique set of insights into the congressional experience and so authentic too, as you read it. It was a delight to read it. Thank you for your effort. David. Well, thank you. you. I appreciate appreciate those comments and appreciate the chance to talk with you. Uh, a very knowledgeable member who uh, is uh, a, a good critic of such efforts for sure. David, when um, I was going through your own biography, and of course, there's a lot that sticks out. You talk about your love of education, and you point out your mother was an educator. Um, But what really intrigued me was in getting your PhD in political science, you managed to squeeze in a degree in divinity. Could you talk a little bit about that? What, What made you want to pursue a degree in divinity, and how has that informed you in public life? It partly was a sign of my vocational uncertainty, I have to say. I uh, was fortunate enough to get a fellowship called a trial year fellowship that gave uh, students who were willing to consider the ministry a chance to have a year in seminary. But um, I think the the answer beyond that would be uh, some of the experiences I had as a young person, and many in my generation uh, had the same experiences. I uh, I grew up in a small town in East Tennessee, very nurturing community. I had a strong religious background, but um, when I came across the mountains to uh, first Mars Hill and then the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, uh, the civil rights movement was in in full sway and the uh, sit-ins in particular were sweeping across the region. And uh, much of that was was based on on a religious faith and a religious profession. Martin Luther King, of course, was a was a minister. And uh, so um, I and many like me had our uh, world shaken. We had our religious and our social and our political views uh, challenged, challenged for the better. I've always been grateful that that was the period in which I uh, came to uh, pay attention to uh, the world around me. And so uh, that um, I, I, I was, I uh, came from a Christian church background, uh, but uh, took up with the Baptists at Bars Hill and, and became president of the Baptist Student Union at North Carolina, you know, UNC. And, and it was the religious groups that led in the, uh, in the sit-ins and the um, picketing of the theaters. And uh, so I was very much caught up in that and particularly yeah. caught up in the uh, social view of the, of the gospel. And, and um, so I, with some encouragement from uh, my mentors, I did consider the ministry. I, I went to Yale Divinity School. I um, I spent the full three years there for the uh, what we call the Bachelor of Divinity degree back then, because I was getting a very very good liberal arts education. But it had become clear to me um, pretty quickly, really, that this was not where I wanted to go vocationally. That in fact I probably would go on for a PhD and have a teaching career. You know, it's really interesting. You and I share that in common. I also studied for the ministry. Uh, and we're not unique. I mean, there are a lot of our colleagues historically who thought about going into the ministry uh, and ultimately decided that public life and the political arena uh, was one way to fulfill uh, their desire for ministry, a different kind of ministry. But the values that informed us and them are values that are still very much relevant to the work we do today. 
Well, and I've, I've gotten to know a lot of uh, ministers, of course, uh, since then. And uh, I think in many ways, our jobs are similar. We're, uh, we're, we're both responding to the, uh, to the public and, and attempting to be good listeners, but also to be interpreters. There's a strong moral imperative uh, behind uh, so much of what we do in politics. Uh, I, I do think uh, that um, it, it is a kind of, of, of ministry, uh, even if the motivation isn't uh, specifically religious. Turning to politics and your political life, you had served as the chairman of uh, the party in North Carolina. You'd been very active in your community in the Raleigh area, um, and you finally decided to try your own hand at it, and you were successful. You got elected uh, for your first term in uh, 1986, and you were reelected three more times, but you were defeated in the Republican landslide, the Newt Gingrich contract with America landslide in 1994. What was that like? And what made you decide you wanted to try it again? Because a lot of people after four terms who are defeated for reelection decide to move on with their lives. You decided to come back and not give up. And, uh, and then I would also ask you to reflect on how did that change you when you succeeded in getting reelected after uh, an interim of one term, how did it change your view, your attitude, your approach to your work in Congress? Well, let me first say that uh, if you had told me when I uh, went on to graduate school, got the degree and came to teach at Duke, if you had told me that 14 years later, I would represent the area in Congress, I would have thought that was uh, uh, insanity. Uh, in fact, um, my wife uh, in, in New Haven got elected to the Board of Aldermen, and I, I sort of pulled her away from, from her political uh, career. She, she uh, unlike uh, me, had a, a New Deal Democratic background in her family, so she had not gone through the same kinds of um, changes that I, that I had, but we, we certainly shared a political outlook, and she was fully supportive when I finally decided that I uh, I'd you know, I could probably do about as well as a lot of the people I've been helping through party work and that I would run myself uh, to try to take that seat back in 1986. So I was I was there for uh, for four terms in what, um, in retrospect, looked like uh, uh, a, a, uh, a, a a different era, you know, a different uh, it was Democratic control. A lot of people wondered if Democratic control of the House would ever change. Uh, it, it was a far cry from the old days when, uh, you know, the segregationist uh, Democratic uh, chairs ruled the roost. But still, there was some of that uh, traditional, uh, certainly, committee strength uh, still around. And, uh, and, and, and then came Newt Gingrich. Then came the, uh, the defeat uh, of me and a lot of other people in 1994, the change in House uh, leadership. And uh, it was a very narrow defeat for me. It was not... Uh, it surprised my friends more than it did me. I, I, I saw a lot of trouble brewing in my town meetings and other things. And it just, uh, it was just a very turbulent year. And, um, I, uh, I, w- I was very much affected by that. I mean, I, I had such, uh, I have two boxes full of uh, letters I received after that defeat. And I treasure those because, uh, there was, there was an outpouring and, um, uh, there was a determination on my part pretty quickly that uh, I didn't want it to end this way, that I would, uh, I would run again. And uh, uh, nobody had expected me to lose, so nobody was lined up waiting to run. So, uh, so we, we had a comeback in 1996, and it was, it was pretty, pretty odd because the, uh, the, the numbers, the, 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 uh, the way the votes came in, it was like uh, 94 was a blip. It never happened. You know, it was like uh, things had been before and uh, the um, but it was it was uh, it, I, don't, I don't recommend it, except that it does give you a reality check and it makes you appreciate your your friends and your supporters. It certainly made me appreciate my academic colleagues who welcomed me back for, uh, you know, the day after the uh, defeat. The president of Duke University was on the phone with me. I will never forget that. And I will never forget 
the many acts of friendship and kindness. And uh, but but I, I just immediately started uh, organizing living room meetings with all kinds of people to say, uh, "What do you think of our politics these days? Should I attempt to run again?" And pretty pretty quickly, I determined the answer was yes, and we uh, we we made a, a very good comeback. So, how did that change you when you came back to Congress, having having not been there for that two year period? Did it change your outlook in the institution or your role in the institution, how you'd relate to your colleagues? How did it change how you approach Congress in terms of your congressional experience? The Congress itself changed. And uh, I, I think most of what I did was adapt to those changes. So we, uh, the, uh, the, the Congress had not been a sharply divided the House had not been a sharply divided institution. Newt New Gingrich did change that. There's, I think most people agree, looking back, that when Newt Gingrich became leader, that signified a, a change in the posture of House Republicans. And it, uh, in, in a sense, it worked for them in, in uh, getting uh, the Democratic leadership of many years shaken loose. But it also meant that the, uh, the House uh, thereafter was a, a more polarized and more uh, contentious place. And uh, so when I came back, I mean, those two years when I was away, Democrats really were in shock. And I, uh, I, I know how difficult those those years were. It was hard enough when I came back in 1997 to uh, realize I was in the minority. Uh, I paid a lot more attention to uh, to my politics in the sense of, uh, of making sure that I was uh, touching base all around, making sure that I was interpreting what I uh, was, was, was doing, uh, doing a lot more uh, outreach. And, uh, but, but also reflecting, and, and the book I think does show this, reflecting on, uh, on some of the things that were lost in the house. And, and it, uh, it was, it was very, divided and there was so much uh, anti-institutional uh, talk. Uh, Newt Gingrich uh, specialized in that. Uh, it's almost like uh, burning down the house to save it from his, uh, his point of view. And, and uh, so uh, the notion that we had some obligation to uh, perform and to make sure the institution performed, even across party lines, that, um, eroded uh, pretty pretty badly and uh, so members like myself who uh, who saw the importance of the institution saw the importance of uh, of a focus on policy and a focus on performance we we had we had some challenges in in the minority but but beyond you know some challenges to uh, to to make the institution work and those challenges uh, continue of course to this day you know uh, in reading about your various campaigns one thing that strikes me is your reliance on polling. Uh, you did a lot of polling in terms of attitudes in your district about issues as well as candidates and campaigns. Um, and you switched around pollsters three or four times. Why did you rely so much on polling and how did that help you um, both frame issues for yourself and win elections? Well, I did tell early in the book uh, the kind of uh, textbook story about how polling can uh, can can change your viewpoint. I uh, I came out of academic life, Duke University professor. I uh, didn't think that was particularly a ticket to Congress, so uh, we we tended to downplay that. But uh, we did take a poll and uh, learned a couple of things from that poll. One is that uh, people thought that teaching and doing research about Congress was actually pretty good preparation for serving in Congress. Maybe, maybe that's what you'd expect in, in my district uh, here with all these universities, but I, I didn't necessarily expect that. Um, and I was running against a, a, a well-known state senator, so that was, uh, that was worth knowing that, uh, that my background looked pretty good to people. And then the second thing, maybe even more surprising, was that on the feeling thermometer, Duke University ranked very high. I wouldn't have bet on that either. So we went from soft peddling my uh, academic credentials to actually shooting an ad with me at the blackboard. Pretty, pretty, pretty uh, strong demonstration of um, how, how polling can, uh, 
can change change your view. I uh, yeah. I don't think you should be slavish about polls. You know, you uh, you have to understand that polls. Um, so much depends on how you ask the question, and 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 your your obligation, of course, as a as an elected official, often is to uh, to interpret, to explain, not to uh, to, to kind of uh, uh, give in to what you think the uh, polling result is, but to, to try to influence that. So I don't I don't uh, I don't uh, like uh, over dependence on polls, but I but I do think. Uh, it's important to uh, have a realistic view of the political lay of the land. That that goes into my changing of pollsters at one point. Uh, I, uh, I I felt like I wanted a pollster who would uh, tell me uh, tell me the grim news if it was grim, you know, and, and not yeah. uh, not sugarcoated at all. And it's very important to to have a pollster who understands the worst case scenario, understands how how things can go badly, and what you might do to prevent that. Yeah, it, it, I think polling, if used well, can inform a member as to where the public is in his or her district. Uh, I can remember when we were debating the Affordable Care Act in my district at the time, we did a poll about it, and it was something like 48% thought it was a great idea and 47% thought it was spawn of Satan. Um, you know, and, and that was the hard reality that year, 2010, uh, right. of reactions initially to the Affordable Care Act. And I had to navigate that, and it didn't drive how I voted, but it certainly helped inform me about the concerns in my constituency they had. And as you point out, at times, polling can also produce counterintuitive insights, like you are going into it thinking, you know, my being a professor an egghead is probably a negative, and I'm going to have to, you know, counter that. And in fact, the polling showed the opposite. No, actually, we like that. Um, that means he's informed. He knows what he's talking about. He's got some credentials that we actually value. Well, you talk about a very close poll result. I talk about two of those in the in the book. One, uh, the Clinton impeachment, and the second, the uh, Iraq War resolution. In uh, in both cases public opinion in my uh, district was uh, not only was it evenly divided, but people on both sides said that uh, it would influence their vote. Yeah. So uh, even if I'd wanted to just test the wind on those, I couldn't have done it. And uh, in both cases, I, I made the decision that I thought was the right decision. And in both cases, uh, public opinion pretty much uh, came, came around. But, uh, oh, it was pretty, uh, pretty dicey there, uh, yeah. not, not knowing uh, which way it was going to go. You also, in your career, in your storied fourth district, you've been redistricted more times than I think anybody I know in Congress uh, by the legislature, by court order. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how redistricting can be used and abused uh, in trying to develop fair representation? North Carolina, your state you come from, is an exemplar for many people of gross gerrymandering that actually does not represent the political division of your state. Uh, and you, your district is certainly an example of a district that's been carved, diced uh, many times. How's that affected you and what's your view about what we ought to do to try to have a fairer process? Well, one thing I added in the fourth edition of the book was uh, an account. Uh, I, I, it, it just is striking how much of the uh, of the litigation about uh, districting and gerrymandering, how much of that has uh, a North Carolina focus. We are ground zero for uh, for a lot of that uh, litigation and many of those disputes. And so I uh, I couldn't find an account of that. And so I just wrote it and put it as a, a part of my chapter on political uh, reform. And as part of that, I did show the uh, successive maps of, uh, of my own district, which, uh, you know, it, I think I have represented all or part of 12 counties in central North Carolina at one time or another. 
which we say, you know, might as well run for Senate if uh, you're gonna gonna do that because <laughs> the uh, the the uh, it's all over the place and and uh, so I've had to constantly adapt. The main the main change in the mid '90s was in response to a court order having to do with uh, racial questions in districting, and I ended up uh, swapping out Central Raleigh for Central Durham, both uh, Democratic areas, but different communities, very different communities. And I, I do talk in the book about that challenge uh, of, of, of shifting uh, focus. And, and then uh, the, the biggest change came uh, after the uh, Tea Party election of 2010, when uh, the 4th District became a uh, poster child for uh, extreme gerrymandering. We were all over the, the news. Uh, and um, I ended up with Fayetteville in my, in my district, which uh, is a pretty, pretty far afield from uh, the Triangle area that I that I represent and that um, that that required a, a, a major adjustment and uh, it um, it's 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 partly a, a matter I guess of uh, trying to uh, you know we have a limited say in this I, I even even when Democrats are in charge of the districting uh, they're gonna follow their own counsel and certainly with Republicans in charge we uh, what I got was a packed district where every Democrat, every African-American in sight, they packed into my district so as to make the others more white and more Republican. That was what was going on. But it meant that uh, it meant that I had to uh, set up offices, adjust to uh, representing different uh, communities. It also meant uh, over time that I went from being a swing member whose main concern was what the Republicans might throw at me to being a, a member in a heavily Democratic district, uh, mainly uh, concerned about what might come from my left, from uh, from you know from uh, from certain elements of the Democratic coalition. That that and, and, is and, a big change. And that, excuse me. me, and David, excuse me, but the reason that happened is because Republican gerrymandering wanted to pack as many minority voters and Democratic voters in a single district or two, so that the rest of the state. Uh, was safe for Republican candidates. Is that not correct? Exactly. That's that's why I say the uh, that that strange district that went from Burlington to Fayetteville. That was the way it was produced. It was a packed district with um, mm. every Democrat, every African American they could find in a in a very strangely shaped uh, district, and that uh, it was a it, it was a big challenge just to represent all that new territory, but it was a, a big political change in that the dynamic of the district, it was mainly a, a concern about what was going on within the Democratic Party, rather than me being a swing seat that uh, was always going to be targeted by the Republicans. Putting on your political science hat for a minute, the Supreme Court of the United States plays a role in all of this too, doesn't it? You talk a little bit in the book about Citizen United and the impact that had in in dark money and in unlimited amounts of money. You also talk about uh, Robert's decision to dismiss a very thorough, comprehensive data produced by the Congress to justify the reauthorization of the preclearance requirements of the Voting Rights Act and striking that down on the rather simplistic argument that, well, a lot of African-Americans are elected to public life. We don't need it anymore. And I guess I'd throw in a third one, which is the uh, dicta of the Supreme Court that we can't have anything to do with overturning partisan gerrymandering. We can if there's clear racial bias, but the fact that one party, you know, uh, pivots itself to its own advantage and gerrymandering is not the business of the court. It seems to me those three uh, developments at the Supreme Court have really changed the playing field and made our elections a lot less fair and a lot less transparent. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And that uh, that ch- third chapter of the book on uh, on our uh, what I call our broken electoral system, you know, features a, a good deal of uh, commentary on uh, on those key Supreme Court uh, decisions. It's uh, it is relevant because right this minute we have another partisan gerrymander in North Carolina, and uh, guess what? We're taking it to state court. 
the uh, the Rucho decision, the one you reference, uh, said that uh, with the, this, there's a long line of Supreme Court decisions regarding racial gerrymandering. How much is too much? How much is too little? Those are those are delicate questions of what kind of balance you strike so that uh, African Americans usually have a have a decent chance of uh, electing a candidate of their of their choice. And then the question about political gerrymandering that permanently puts uh, people of a political persuasion in a in a minority position and, and, and is done in a very extreme way. That that was the question raised by uh, by some of the uh, the gerrymanders here after the racial questions were, were more or less resolved. And we went to state court and got uh, got a favorable decision. Uh, and that's the district I'm in uh, at this at this moment. But the Republicans have uh, done a new set of maps, which is subject, which are subject to similar challenges. And so right now we're testing that proposition of whether the North Carolina state constitution and state courts can be uh, will will can be interpreted to rule out partisan gerrymanders. Now that the uh, federal Supreme Court, by a five four decision, decided that they could not rule out such things. Uh, the other decision is also very, very important. The Voting Rights Act, we're still fighting to restore the Voting Rights Act after the pre-clearance procedures were, uh, were, were were ruled out by the Supreme Court. And Citizens United and subsequent decisions have simply opened the floodgates on campaign finance. So it's, um, it's, it's uh, there's no question that these court decisions have, uh, have that, that's been the branch of government that has led the way on these matters. And, and I would say in a in a pretty negative way. I agree. And in fact, frankly, I think it's uh, an abuse of their role in terms of determining constitutionality of laws passed by the Congress. I don't think James Madison ever would have agreed with Robert's decision to dismiss research and data that was very comprehensive to justify the reauthorization of the preclearance requirements of the Voting Rights Act. That was an egregious and uh, dismissive act by Judge, uh, Chief Justice, Justice Roberts that uh, I think is going to be remembered as an overreach, a gross overreach by the United States Supreme Court well, with the, respect the to the separation of, this, of powers. Right. And, and the account of this in, in the book, uh, you know, also underscores the uh, increasing uh, polarization and, and I would say the increased movement in a right-wing direction, a kind of asymmetric polarization on the part of the Republican Party. I, I uh, Early in my career, I took on a lot of uh, campaign reform uh, measures. I got uh, stand by your ad, the, the requirement that a candidate appear in his ad and take responsibility for it. I got that in the, uh, in the McCain-Feingold uh, uh, reform bill, but but that was McCain and Feingold. That was bipartisan, That's right. you know. And the the Voting Rights Act too. I mean, it was almost unanimous at one point. And now, yeah. now and, we oh, are yeah. fighting. It, That's right. It had yeah. huge bipartisan support. Yeah, red, right. Campaign reform in general and uh, voting rights uh, also. And and uh, so uh, in this area, as in so many others. Uh, we have uh, gotten to a, to an almost totally polarized situation, and I really think that has more to do with changes in the Republican Party than it does with any changes in, in the merits of these issues. So you get back to Congress, and you're reflecting in this book on almost advice for a new member, right? And there are two that really stick out that I think are important that I'd like you to elaborate on. One is you say, find your niche. Um, you know, you can't be all things to all people. You can't be an expert in every issue. You got to find your niche in Congress, especially in a body with 435 members. Uh, and the other interesting uh, piece of advice and insight you've got is uh, an advocacy for policy entrepreneurship, uh, which also intrigued me. So I wonder if you'd elaborate on those two uh, pieces of wisdom that uh, really struck me as uh, as very resonant. Well, I do uh, I do recount in the book, and this this is uh, this is taken from the very early editions, uh, and I've left it in because people find it of interest. How it was that I uh, 
made my way to the Appropriations Committee and found a niche where I could be uh, happy and productive working in the institution. And um, I also, from my from my days as a staff member, you and I share uh, a history as staff members in the uh, House. Hey, you worked, I, you worked for a senator from Alaska. Yes, Bob Bartlett of Alaska in the 60s, the time when a lot of things were happening in the Senate and, and a lot of legislation was getting initiated. And uh, I, uh, I wrote a, I, I was a staff member for, for, for Bob Bartlett. I, uh, I led his staff work on the uh, Radiation Protection Act, uh, a, a consumer protection measure. So when you go to the dentist and, and a lead apron is put on you before your x-ray, you can thank um, Senator Bartlett for, for that. Uh, so I, uh, but I wrote about this. I, uh, I was simultaneously gathering information for my doctoral dissertation, going back to his office every summer. And I, I began to, to think, uh, you know, there is a good bit of initiation going on here, even with Lyndon Johnson and even with the great society, this isn't just a totally presidentially driven system. And what's more, these staff members have a lot to do with this. Magnuson, Warren Magnuson of Washington, a kind of, uh, oh, a very traditional senator. Nonetheless, he had this red hot staff. You remember that? And they they yeah. generated all kinds of uh, radiation protection and other other legislation. And I uh, so I, I coined the term in my dissertation, policy entrepreneurship, to, uh, to describe that, uh, that phenomenon. Well, long story short, when I come to the Congress, uh, uh, you know, sometime later, I did, uh, I, I did appreciate, I think, the, uh, the potential, even in the House where the party leadership is more, is tighter and, and the committees aren't quite what they used to be, there still is room for individual members to, uh, to grab hold of an issue and to figure out how to promote it and how to get it done. And um, I've always said to my staff that I, I want to be a policy entrepreneur and I want you to, to uh, you know, to facilitate that. Let's look for gaps in policy. Let's look for things right. that need to be addressed uh, because that's one of the, uh, unlike most parliaments in the world, the, um, the Congress of the United States still leaves a good deal of initiative in the hands of individual members and committees if they seize it. And, and uh, that policy entrepreneurship, the wellspring of that can be from anywhere, right? It can be from people you happen to know, places you go, a, a talk or a speech or an article you read. Uh, right. it, it, can, it also can come from your district, can it? Where your casework suddenly reveals some kind of problem that needs to be addressed legislatively. Absolutely. And those can be, those can be very small items, uh, you know, very narrowly uh, conceived items that deal with a specific problem, but they're certainly important to some people, and uh, often we pick it up in our casework. You also talk, besides your uh, your long and, and distinguished uh, service on the Appropriations Committee, which you, uh, you document um, in the book, you also talk about um, the role of informal caucuses and groups. And you, I think you talked about how the growth of those informal caucuses and groups is now something like 700 plus. So there are lots of caucuses organized around other countries, uh, causes, issues. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. How important are those in your uh, experience, in your 30-year experience in Congress? And what advice would you give other members in terms of picking and choosing uh, how to get involved in them. Well, I know you, sh you chair a few of these caucuses yourself and, uh, I, I have uh, agreed to chair or co-chair a number of them. And it's a, it's a, it's an important way for a member to, uh, extend himself or herself and to, uh, show support for a group or a country or an issue. Um, I, uh, for, for example, co-chair the Moldova Caucus, a small country in Eastern Europe that has a sister state relationship with North Carolina. That one's pretty easily explained. But um, uh, when I first uh, when I first got there, I uh, we had a Sunbelt Caucus. We called it, and my work on the Sunbelt Caucus, which was southeastern states, uh, led to a major legislative initiative where uh, where we got the National Science Foundation engaged for the first time with the community colleges in developing. Uh, uh, workplace-based uh, uh, 
training. And so, uh, yes, these are these are informal groups. They are a way of extending your reach, and they uh, there's so many of them. Uh, they, you know, it's not like we meet every day, or you know, most of them are virtual caucuses, really and truly. And it's a network that lets you alert people when something needs uh, attention. But um, it's it's almost a question of why don't you have a caucus with with some groups you know you 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 really uh there, there's some advantages for uh having some an informal group of members organized around your uh, cause or your interest i i, I want to say something else though a little less uh, positive maybe i think uh i think the uh another set of caucuses are ideological caucuses the uh mm-hmm. the best known i guess most notorious is the freedom caucus in the republican party which uh you know brought down Speaker Boehner and and has made made it almost impossible to govern on the Republican side. A group of extreme right wing members. Uh, we have ideological caucuses on the on the Democratic side, and uh, ranging from the Blue Dogs to the Progressive Caucus, and and uh, they are they are ways that members can uh, band together with like minded members and and uh, develop ideas. Uh, I don't think. Uh, I don't think they should have a. Uh, I don't think they should have a, a, a make or break role in the house, though. And I'm, I just raise that as a as, as a concern. We uh, we are a very closely divided house now, and uh, we need you know, people to have a sense of institutional responsibility. We need to have our committees fully engaged, and uh, I don't think uh, it's helpful when members get the idea that the only way to show they really care about something is to threaten to bring the house down over it. And, and sometimes these caucuses, uh, get, uh, get in a, in a position where, uh, where they're, um, they're, they're deal makers and deal breakers. And, uh, so I, th- I think th- those caucuses have a useful role, but they also need to be careful and responsible in the way they exercise that role because, uh, in, in, at the end of the day, uh, it's the Democratic Party, the majority party in the House, that has to deliver. And, and that, seg- that allows me to segue into my next set of questions, because you talk in the book about the role of the party. And you talk about, like, back home, party's important, but you've got to organize your own campaign. You can't just rely on the party to get you elected. But once you get elected, how important is the party? Uh, the Democratic caucus, Democratic rules and procedures, uh, being a team player and a loyal member in uh, sustaining leadership on key votes, especially procedural votes. Um, what's been your experience in terms of the evolution of that uh, in your 30 years in the Congress? The party uh, looms, looms very large, uh, and it always has, in my, my experience, uh, the uh, the House is a chamber where the majority rules and the majority party uh, uh, has all the leadership positions on committees and, and determines the agenda and uh, mm-hmm. it's the, and determines the, the flow of business. So, so the uh, role of party leaders has always been very powerful and very important. I think the uh, recent years have seen more centralization, though, and, and more powers in the hands of party leaders and a good part of a couple of chapters of the book are uh, are devoted to trying to explain that and uh, assess it. Um, one one thing that's happened is that our politics has gotten more contentious and more ideological, and so uh, the parties have become uh, more more homogeneous internally and 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 farther apart in terms of their approach to uh, to public policy. And often the parties are extremely competitive and uh, the chamber's closely divided. Well, that's a formula for uh, needing really to have a strong, a strong party. You, you know, the situation where the committees uh, kind of do their, do their own thing and put things together on a bipartisan basis. I mean, I, I experienced some of that, especially in my first four terms, and I, I greatly enjoyed it. Uh, I, I was on committees where I could initiate things and put uh, uh, agreements together with people on both sides of the aisle, and, and uh, it, it's a very satisfying way to legislate. That has become much more difficult, though, and, and uh, it's partly that, uh, I mean, again, the biggest change was Newt Gingrich and the way he centralized uh, uh, 
uh, leadership on the Republican side hadn't been that centralized since um, Uncle Joe Cannon a century earlier. But then when Nancy Pelosi became speaker, uh, she wasn't about to reverse and go back to the days when, uh, you know, Danny Rostenkowski and John Dingell ruled the roost. Uh, and, and we didn't want her to. You know, we, 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 we knew that we needed strong leadership and that um, often you couldn't just leave things to their own devices. There would have to be a leadership thrust to get uh, major things done. So but let me, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me let me, David, let me interrupt you there just a little bit. Has that gotten even more pronounced during the pandemic? Because yes, that, we, that we've, actually we've witnessed that, almost six trillion dollars in COVID-related bills, I think five bills, all of them controlled by, if not written by, leadership. Things go in, things come out, uh, not by will of a committee markup, but at a leadership level in terms of what they think the traffic can bear. That's a pretty, pretty dramatic development. Granted, it's in a pandemic, but it's certainly it seems to me would further diminish the role of committees in shaping legislation. Right. I think, uh, you know, to, to uh, generalize somewhat, I, I think crises tend to centralize power. Wouldn't you say, I mean, uh, if you're um, it's, it's one thing to pass your appropriations bills uh, one at a time in the, in the normal fashion, but uh, Often we can't do that. Often uh, you're, you're jammed up at the end of the session. Often you have uh, a lot of contentious issues. You have a lack of partisan cooperation. You have a threatened government shutdown. Under those circumstances, you know, I, as uh, the subcommittee chairman of transportation and housing, you know, this thing goes above my pay grade at that point. And, and it takes the leadership to negotiate an omnibus bill or a, uh, or some kind of, budget deal. And uh, so we've seen this before the pandemic. We'd seen a kind of centralization that was um, that was rooted in uh, in crises, some of them natural, some of them man-made. Well, the pandemic is a crisis and the pandemic legislation has been a huge challenge. And I give our leadership, uh, starting with Nancy Pelosi, huge credit for, uh, for getting this together. Uh, but there's no question the centralization has uh, reached a point where uh, I, I'm sure post-pandemic, I'm sure in uh, future years, uh, there will be a, a good deal of sentiment for for trying to return to a, a, a more balanced system where the committees have uh, more more autonomy in, in, in formulating legislation. David, I want to, uh, in the time we got left, uh, talk about two more things. One is your interest in foreign policy. Uh, obviously, uh, you're the chairman of the House Democracy uh, project HGP is a, a, a love of yours. You've devoted enormous amounts of time to it, promoting democracy overseas. And of course, you've also shown uh, great leadership on issues of uh, deep uh, concern to most Americans in the Middle East, especially, uh, both with the two-state uh, issue uh, with respect to Israel and the Palestinian uh, community uh, in the Middle East and the Iran nuclear agreement. Talk a little bit about what what uh, attracted you to the foreign policy aspect of your career and what kind of legacy you hope to leave uh, given your leadership of HDP especially. Well, you've been my partner in both of those enterprises and I'm very grateful for that. You as the head of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and someone who's appreciated the uh, need for legislatures to support each other uh, that uh, experience for me came uh, very early in my period in the Congress. I used to say it's about the only time my political science background was directly relevant was when under Martin Frost's leadership, uh, the U.S. House reached out to the newly emergent parliaments in Central and Eastern Europe and uh, helped bring them along to, to join the family of uh, democratic European uh, parliaments. Uh, Newt Gingrich uh, let that lapse unwisely uh, we brought it back on a bipartisan basis 15 years ago, 16 years ago. And we've since uh, worked in uh, Central and Eastern Europe, but also all over the world in countries where there's uh, uh, a, a will to work with us, a desire to work with us, and where we can mutually uh, 
strengthen our, our institutions and share best practices. So we, uh, we have a couple of dozen partners ar- around the world. And uh, I, uh, you know, the first two editions of this book didn't even have a foreign policy chapter. But I was always interested in foreign policy, and I, uh, I gradually got more involved, initially with the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, which you now uh, lead. And then um, I, I, I got eventually into the area of these developing countries and the uh, parliament to parliament uh, support that we uh, that, that we offer. So that that is important to me. And um, it, it and, counts. And out David, I think, about- I, David, David, I think we should just clarify. And, and one of the, the cornerstone mission of HDP is to parliament to parliament, our Congress to a parliament overseas, Right. is to make ourselves a resource to help them create democratic processes to have a robust democratic parliament in these emerging democracies. Is that right? That's exactly right. And I, I should say uh, the first question people often ask when you give that kind of description is, well, what do you think of our own democracy? <laughs> and um, we've always had a sense that uh, democracy is a work in progress. And we had... Um, we, we had a lot to learn as well as a lot to share. And, of course, that's a, a very acute sense right now with the events of the last uh, of, of the last year. But, but yes, it's, um, it's a matter of uh, direct member-to-member, staff-to-staff, peer outreach in uh, parliamentary development. The, uh, the Middle Eastern involvements, there, there too, we've been partners. Uh, if people check the index, they will find that out in a number of these efforts to... Uh, promote uh, the Iran nuclear agreement, to promote two-state diplomacy, to, uh, to move American foreign policy in, into a position of being, uh, in, in some cases, more balanced, more helpful in, in, in pushing all parties toward a, a settlement, because the, uh, the situation with Israel and, and the Palestinians is not, is not tenable, and and uh, it, the friends of uh, the friends of both sides need to uh, need to push to, uh, to to move toward a resolution. It's very discouraging right now, but uh, but extremely Im- important to uh, keep a focus on that issue. I, I had a uh, early exposure. Lisa and I, uh, my wife and I, uh, traveled to uh, to Israel early in uh, my tenure. I uh, had, had a, a, a spark lit that. Uh, Made, made me very interested in this issue all through my congressional career. And it's, um, it is something I write about in the book because I do think uh, uh, the uh, often opposing or resisting some of our own leadership, uh, we, have, uh, we have moved the Democratic caucus and, and, and congressional policy in, um, in a positive uh, direction. So, so that is a major theme of the book. And, and I think it's important, isn't it, David, to note in reiterating that that is the policy of the United States Congress and the United States government, that, that every administration, except potentially maybe that of Donald Trump, has, has uh, in recent years has basically said the policy of the United States is that we need two states, a state of Israel and a state for the Palestinians, if we're going to resolve the Middle East peace process. Is that correct? Yes, I, for the life of me, I can't, I can't see an alternative, even though we all know how, how difficult this, uh, this is. And, uh, you know, the danger is this just becomes a platitude. Um, and uh, and I, I think uh, you and I and others uh, concerned about this have tried to make it more than a platitude, tried to, tried to ask what kind of specific steps need to be taken to, to move us toward an eventual uh, settlement. And maybe just talk briefly about the Iran nuclear agreement, because this was also a source of contention. There were a lot of people arguing Iran can't be uh, trusted. It will cheat. It's engaged in other malign behavior that should be included in the nuclear agreement. Why did you decide to support the nuclear agreement? And what, what do you think were the consequences of Donald Trump ripping it up and walking away from it? I think it's uh, my candidate for the worst day of Donald Trump's presidency would be the day he blew up the Iran nuclear agreement. Uh, it uh, it was a masterful diplomatic achievement that involved uh, our European allies as well as Russia and China, and uh, 
uh, brought Iran to the point where there was going to be the most uh, extensive inspection regime, the most extensive uh, regime in, of, of nuclear non-proliferation in, uh, in ever ever concluded. This was a masterful uh, agreement, a masterful achievement, and uh, I uh, and friends in the House uh, were uh, were very supportive of this effort. Uh, a lot of the uh, more uh, reactionary forces that we encounter in uh, in Middle East politics generally were uh, were uh, opposed to this agreement or were resistant to it. And uh, unfortunately, uh, Israeli Prime Minister uh, Netanyahu uh, led that parade, and and and, and there was lots of um, lots of resistance, certainly among Republicans, but even in Democratic circles, uh, a kind of lack of uh, leadership, I thought. In, in supporting this agreement and, and later in protecting it. So we, uh, we formed an informal uh, gang of eight, which uh, at different stages, uh, we wrote letters, we supported resolutions, we showed support for that diplomatic effort on the part of the Obama administration. And in the end, and it, it, before it was over, Obama himself got actively involved, Speaker Pelosi got actively involved, we organized uh, decisively enough members to uh, protect that agreement against any kind of attempts to uh, to, to to damage it uh, legislatively. And this was uh, this is an interesting story, I think, because it um, it is extra official in the sense that it didn't come through the party, didn't come through the committees. It was a group of concerned members who uh, took it upon ourselves to protect that agreement. And of course, my fondest hope right now would be that uh, we would have a, a new agreement to protect in the uh, months to come. But the difficulty of putting this back together just underscores the damage Donald Trump did. And I think it's important to note for the record that the inspections of Iran during the nuclear agreement when it was in force found that, in fact, Iran was not cheating and had found itself in full compliance with the metrics set out in the what's called the JCPOA, the Iran Nuclear Agreement. Is that correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. It was the U.S. that broke the agreement. Yeah. And, uh, and the result may be a nuclear Iran, the very thing, not only the United States government, but also the Israeli government we're trying to avoid. Right. And, and now, now you, of course, hear all these uh, members of the Israeli uh, military and, and uh, security establishment saying this was a terrible mistake. Of course, some of them said it at the time. But unfortunately, uh, Netanyahu uh, dominated that discourse from the Israeli side, and he was invited, uh, you remember the story, he was invited to, by Republicans alone, to address uh, a joint session of, of the Congress, trashing the uh, agreement. Uh, yeah. A huge, uh, a huge blow to... Uh, to, to um, the, the, the prospects for any kind of bipartisan understanding of what we needed to do in order to contain uh, a nuclear Iran or prevent a nuclear Iran. Let me, uh, let me end this interview, and I hate to end it because uh, your insights are so fascinating and your experience so rich. Um, we just celebrated, if I can put it that way, we remembered the dreadful anniversary of January 6th, the insurrection of the United States Capitol by a, an incited mob incited by the President of the United States, Donald Trump, to attempt to prevent the constitutional ministerial function of Congress in joint session to witness the counting of the electoral ballots. And, and that kind of epitomizes for a lot of people the fact that democracy is in trouble our politics is so broken that we're now risking the normalization of violence. And we, a year on, still have the big lie that the election was stolen being repeated and believed by a substantial number of people. As you come to the close of your congressional career, what do you think about that? What kind of hope do you have for us? You want to leave with us that uh, we've been through this before. We can get through this. It will get better or not. 
Well, the book, uh, the manuscript was put to bed uh, 18 months ago. And uh, there's a lot in that book about Donald Trump and about the norm shattering uh, character of his presidency and, and the dangers that uh, loomed from that. Uh, but I could never have predicted the, uh, the, you know, the final chapter that occurred on, uh, on January 6th as, uh, as Trump perpetrated the, the lie that the election had been stolen and, and actually encouraged um, his supporters to, uh, to try to overturn the verdict and to block the peaceful transfer of power. Who would have ever believed this? And so I, uh, <clears throat> I, I do think we, we need to uh, re-examine the premise most of us have had all of our lives, that, uh, that American democracy is, uh, is secure and the checks and balances work almost mechanistically. They don't. They don't. We know that. And so uh, part of what we need to take from this, I think, is a, a rededication on the part of, of all of us to, uh, to, to make sure that uh, we, we uh, strengthen our institutions. And, and this isn't a matter of just an individual politicians uh, speaking out. This is a matter of, of a kind of civic virtue, you might say. The founders would have said that, whereby we, we strengthen and defend our institutions and make them perform in effective ways and sometimes subordinate our own desires to the, the need for a, uh, a collective uh, result. We need to make our institutions work and make democracy perform. Um, but I, I do think a special responsibility lies on the part of, lies in the opposition, uh, the, uh, the Republican opposition. This, this country needs a center-right party and a center-left party, both of whom play by the rules and respect uh, the ground rules of our, our democracy. And uh, the Republicans are in, at, at the point of losing that. I, I really didn't think it would take that turn after January 6th. I thought that would be the breaking point, but it turns out uh, that it wasn't. And so there is great danger. And um, I've just been through, as you have, the, uh, the January 6th observances here. They are very, very sobering. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that uh, our democracy hangs in, in, in the balance. So uh, there are uh, responsibilities we have to perform as an institution to uh, protect ourselves uh, in the future and 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 their responsibilities that every citizen in this country has to um, to to seek out and understand the truth and to support uh, leadership that will uh, will uphold democracy so uh, it's um, it, it is a perilous time i you know it's it is a it's a quite a time to be leaving the congress i i said when i announced my retirement that um, i didn't expect a sense of closure in the sense of having everything done but I didn't expect it would be this radically uh, uncertain, you know, the, what the future holds. So I take a lot of satisfaction in things we've been able to do, and I'm hopeful about a lot of that, but I'm also deeply apprehensive. Well, let me just say, knowing you and having had the privilege of serving with you and traveling with you, um, you're the exemplar of democratic uh, resilience. You're a model for people in terms of how it can and should work. And I don't believe that your decades of service in the Congress will go um, unnoted, unrecognized. I think they will make a difference, but the rest of us are going to have to continue the fight. And I think you've made a wonderful contribution in your book, The Congressional Experience. If more people read it, they're going to get they're going to be inspired by your decency, your respect for the institution, your love of the democratic process and your commitment to your constituents and the country. David, thank you for your years of service. I wish you and Lisa Godspeed. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks for a wonderful conversation and for those kind words and for your friendship. Uh, your um, the kind of colleagueship that we have is um, is is a, a good part of what makes uh, the job rewarding and worthwhile. Thank you so much. Thank you, David. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. If you enjoyed this podcast, listen to C-SPAN's new podcast about books. Learn about the latest nonfiction books and best-selling authors. In each episode, we report on bestseller lists and book reviews from around the country. You'll also hear authors talking about their latest books and insider interviews with nonfiction book publishing industry experts.